Tonight I want to speak to you on the subject of how to walk in the favor of God in the last days. Most people are spiritually intelligent enough to know that we're living in the last days. I mean, if you have any fundamental knowledge of Bible prophecy, if you've ever read the book of Revelation, you pretty much have to be living off grid or with your head in the sand not to see what is going on not only in our nation and not only around the world, but to be able to see that the signs of the times that Jesus spoke of in Matthew 24 are easily seen. And I'm well aware of the fact that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 36, no man knows the day nor the hour that the Son of Man will return, no, not the angels in heaven, but my Father only. But when we read and properly interpret Scripture, we must always do that in context. And in that same chapter where Jesus said, no one knows the day nor the hour, he also said, you'll know when it's nigh, even at the door. And so Jesus forbid date setting. But he did not forbid awareness of the hour in which we live. And I think one of the concerns that many people have because we're watching America, it seems like, unravel before our very eyes. All that this nation seemed to represent, the foundations upon which it was built, even our allegiances to Israel, and we could go on down the line, it seems like everything this nation was built upon is under assault. But I'll tell you this, though many Christians are fearful, and anxious, having trouble sleeping, Bible prophecy will provide a peace even in the midst of the end times and the prophetic storm that boils all around us. And one of the things that I want to leave with you tonight from the word of God is that from the beginning of the church age, as we've already preached Jesus prophesied, I will build the church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it in Matthew 16. And we define for you that the church age was inaugurated in Acts chapter 2. And the church age continues until the rapture. That is the church age from the first century until the rapture of the church. As we've also taught you in shown you from the scriptures that the next major event is the rapture of the church. Jesus promised that throughout that church age that you and I as believers are now living in that he'll build the church. And so the world is going to get darker. But the church is going to get brighter. Many people don't consider the book of Proverbs a book of prophecy. And it's not a book of prophecy. It's a book of proverbs and wisdom and godly counsel. But there are a handful of prophecies in the book of Proverbs, one of which is found in the fourth chapter. And listen carefully to what it says. In Proverbs 4, the prophecy is, listen carefully, don't miss it. The path of the just is like a shining light that shines more and more unto that perfect day. The path of the just. How many of you know that through Jesus Christ and the shed blood of the cross, his death, his burial, and his resurrection, that we have been justified by the blood of the spotless lamb. And all the way back in Proverbs, the Bible declared that the path of the just is like a shining light that will shine more and more unto the perfect day. The perfect day is the revelation of Jesus Christ coming back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And on these last days in which we live, the world is going to get worse, 
but the church is going to go forward and upward and shine brighter and brighter and so shall it be for the justified of the Lord. Hey, if you believe it, give Jesus a mighty hand of praise. How to walk in the favor of God in the last days. Psalm 25, go down to verse 8. The Lord is good and does what is right. He shows the proper path to those who go astray. Let me pause. Some of you that might be listening to me tonight, if you'd be honest with God and honest with yourself, you are not on the proper path. You have been led astray. Temptations have pulled you in a direction that has caused you to wander away from God. Something happened in your life that caused you to become despondent or discouraged and you gave up on God even though God never gave up on you. Some of you that are listening to me have never repented of sin and asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. But there are always people within the sound of my voice who if you'd be completely transparent with the holy God, you're not living a holy life. You're backslidden and away from the Lord. And the Bible prophesied in the last days that there would be a great falling away from faith. The Bible prophesied in the last days that if possible, the very elect would be deceived. But I have good news for you. There is a prophet in the Old Testament. His name is Hosea. And Hosea said in the 14th chapter and the 4th verse, I will love you freely and I will heal your backsliding. Jesus Christ not only died to bring salvation to the lost, he died and shed his blood to bring backsliders back home to the foot of the cross. When I'm done preaching tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity to put your feet back by the mercies of God on the path that leads to the eternal shore that God created you to walk upon. And there is no sin in your life greater than the grace of God. But you must come quickly, for the Lord could come tonight. As you have learned this week, there is not one single prophecy, not one single sign in the Bible for the rapture. The rapture is a signless event. It can happen at any moment. It could happen before I'm done preaching. And I don't say that for effect or emotional tug. Accurately and biblically, the rapture could interrupt our time together tonight. But when the trumpet of God sounds for the rapture of the church, the Bible says it will be in the twinkling of an eye. A group of scientists got together and decided that that's exactly one twelve thousandth of a second. I don't know exactly how long it is. I can tell you that's a group of scientists with far too much free time on their hands. But if it's anywhere near one twelve thousandth of a second, that's not time enough to pray. That's not time enough to repent. That's not time enough to go to church and fall at an altar and cry out to God. That's not time enough to speed dial your favorite pastor. And any pastor that picks up the phone after the rapture isn't worth talking to anyway. All the real ones will be gone. So I'm going to challenge you as we begin this message tonight to allow the Holy Spirit to soften you and prepare you for the invitation that I'll give at the end of this message. I'm not asking you to join a church. I'm not asking you to become a Protestant or a Catholic or a Baptist or a Presbyterian and I'm not being critical of denominations. I'm just telling you that when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, he's not coming for people with denominational memberships. He's coming for people who have repented of sin and received Jesus Christ as Lord. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, God loves you. 
Maybe it's been a long time since anybody's told you that, but I'm here tonight to tell you God loves you. I love you, but I can't make that decision for you. If you're the worst sinner in the state of Florida, tonight I'm your best friend. Whether you're here in this live audience or watching online, listening to a podcast or any other platform of communication, don't let this opportunity to turn from sin and turn to Christ pass you by. In Jesus' name, all God's people said amen. The Lord is good and does what is right. He shows the proper path. Even to those who go astray, he leads the humble in doing right, teaching them his way. The Lord leads with unfailing love and faithfulness all who keep his covenant and obey his demands. Highlight that. Verse 10. The Lord leads with unfailing love and faithfulness all who keep his covenant and obey his demands. That's one of the great biblical keys to walking in supernatural favor in the last days. You've got to be an obedient servant. You've got to walk in humility of heart before the Lord God. Verse 11, for the honor of your name, O Lord, forgive my many, many sins. Who are those who fear the Lord? He will show them the path they should choose. They will live in prosperity. If you believe it and receive it by faith, say amen. amen. Those who walk in the covenant, and obey the commands of the Lord. The Bible said that he'll lead your path and verse 13 said, they will live in prosperity and their children will inherit the land. Pause right there. Right relationship with God will not only put his favor upon you, that favor will be extended to your children and even your grandchildren. If you teach them the ways of the Lord. By the way, I know there are a lot of people that get quite upset anytime a preacher would dare read the word prosperity out of the Bible. And I'll be honest with you, I'm perfectly aware of the fact that there are a lot of false teachings on the subject. I'm perfectly aware that there are a lot of scam artists that call themselves preachers. I wasn't born yesterday and this isn't my first rodeo. I've been in full-time ministry worldwide for over four decades. I've met hundreds of them who take this message and being gracious, preach a greasy, greasy interpretation of prosperity. But to take prosperity, a word that's in the Bible, by the way, 134 times in the Old Testament, God referred to his prosperity resting upon his people. And it's not spiritual prosperity only. The Bible said even in the New Testament, the apostle Paul spoke to his son in the ministry, Timothy, and he said, Timothy, godliness is profitable unto all things, both in the life now and in the life that is to come. And some of the greasy scam artists take the message of blessing and favor and prosperity and it's all about your life here and temporary things and driving this car and having this much money and living in this kind of home. And I'm not opposed to God blessing you with anything. I really am not. And then there are those who preach prosperity as if it has nothing to do with this life, but it's all spiritual and in the sweet by and by. But the Bible said and Paul said, godliness is profitable both in the life now and in the life that is to come. And I came to tell you tonight that in the last days, regardless of what happens in the world, regardless of what happens in America, regardless 
regardless of what happens in this county, regardless of what happens to our currency and our economy, my God will not fail. And his word is everlasting and true. Hey, give the Lord a mighty shout of praise. They will live in prosperity and their children will inherit the land. The Lord is a friend to those who fear him and he teaches them his covenant. Praise God for the reading of his word. Let's pray. Father, once again, as we open up the Holy Bible, we humble our hearts in your holy presence. We humble our heart before these precious people. Wash us fresh in the blood of Jesus. Don't let anything in hand or heart hinder the fullness of the sweet oil of heaven, the precious anointing of the Lord. Let the glory of God come in this place. We recognize, Father, that you're doing something supernatural here. We recognize the unusual blessing and presence of God. From the beginning of the service, as we were here earlier, people kneeling around these altars praying. Well before the service ever started. The faithfulness of God's people. Bless them. May they indeed learn how to walk in the favor of God in these last days. And I pray that you would anoint me to communicate the values of the scripture that make it so. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen and amen. As I was praying this afternoon and reading the scriptures and going over what I was going to preach and asking the Lord to add what I should say and edit what I shouldn't say and it dawned upon me as I was making final preparations that some of the things that I'm going to say tonight are going to be said in such a way, just as a father, I spoke to my son and just as a father, I spoke to my daughter. So I love you enough tonight to tell you before the night is over, I'll probably at some point step on everybody's toes I will probably offend a good number of you. Some of you, if you're spiritually immature, are going to leave with your feelings hurt. But I just want to warn you up front that everything I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell it to you straight because I love you. I'm going to tell it to you just like I talk to my boy or my girl who are grown, married, with kids, and gone but I'm gonna tell it to you straight from the pages of the Bible without apology because how many of you know that you can't soft soap the message of God? People, the Bible says, must be willing to receive both milk and meat. And some of the meat tonight's gonna to be a little chewy. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm ready, how about you? Tonight, as you listen to the word of God, here's the theme that I want to drive home with multiple exclamation points, and that is I want you to understand, because some of you really don't understand this, or perhaps not in the way that you should, because it's not functional in your life. A lot of you would raise your hand and say, amen, I believe in the blessing of God, or amen, I believe in the favor of God. Or thank God there is a supernatural outpouring that comes from the hand of the Father. You believe in it, but you don't walk in it. I want to take you, if the Lord would help me tonight, through the Bible so that you can understand in a clear way how to not only understand the favor of God, but how do you implement the favor of God so that in all of your coming in and in all of your going out, the favor of the Lord follows you like a holy wind. Amen. Because in Deuteronomy 28, in the covenant God gave to Abraham and to his seed, 
He said, I'll bless you coming in and I'll bless you going out. I'll surround you. I'll bless you in the city. I'll bless you in the country. I'll bless your basket. I'll bless your children. I'll bless everything that your hand touches. There is a supernatural blessing that comes from the hand of God that is beyond your efforts, beyond your abilities, beyond your entrepreneurial gift, beyond your skill sets, whereby easily you walk through life and the wind of God is continually blowing in your sails, taking you from where you're at to where you need to be. I've paid a price for this. And it's not cheap. But you can walk in it. And if you believe it and receive it, say a big amen. amen. In the book of Genesis, in the very beginning of the Holy Bible, in the story of creation, Adam and Eve were created to live in right relationship with God. They were created to enjoy all of his blessing and favor. They were created to have dominion over everything in God's wondrous creation. And the Bible said that you and I were created in the image of God. Genesis 1.27, the Bible says, So God created human beings in his own image, in the image of God, he created them male and female. Highlight that. There are two genders according to God. Amen. New York State has over 32 legal genders that people can identify with. I told you I was going to offend some people tonight, but I've got to preach what the Bible says, whether people like it or not. I'm not running for office. I'm not running for a political campaign. And I certainly don't have any Christmas bonuses riding on this. I say this lovingly and not arrogantly. God created male and female. And civilization had that figured out throughout all of human history until recent months when we got so smart <laughs> Kellogg's now has cereal boxes with gender quizzes on the sides of your children's breakfast cereals that probe them to pick out and to choose what genders they identify with. You better be careful of everything you buy and bring in your house. Just because you wheel down aisle four in the local grocery store and your kid says, I want that, and you grab it without thought and put it in the buggy, I'm here to tell you the devil's doing his advertising on everything. Keep your home holy. Keep your home holy. It's one of the keys to the favor of God. You've got to do be you got to do more than be holy at church. You need to be holy at home. Some of you, one of the first steps to increasing the favor of God is you ought to go home, walk through every room in your house, stop and pray and say, Father, show me anything in this room that grieves the Holy Ghost. Show me anything in this house that grieves the Holy Ghost. Show me any art hanging on my wall. Show me any hobby hidden in a closet. Show me anything that makes you upset. Show me what it is and I'll lay it at an altar and remove it. Clean your house and God will fill your house. Clean your house and God will fill your house. Can't leave church services and go home and turn on Netflix and binge watch a bunch of stuff that breaks every of the Ten Commandments 16 times in the first 20 minutes. Thank you for all those amens. That's why they take the offering first. Genesis 1.28, then he placed his blessing upon Adam and Eve and gave them access to all good things and authority over all other creatures. 
You are not just a part of the ecosystem walking in equality with a spotted owl. You are not one with the bark on the tree in your yard. Only humanity was created in the image of God. And we walk not only holy, but we walk high. Amen. High above all things, in dominion and authority by the commandment and creation of God. Amen. I want to break this down in three pieces. And especially I see so many when I preach here that bring your Bibles and notebooks and highlighters. and That always encourages me. That's how you know people really want to learn the word of God. They realize that their mind has limitations in memory, but their pencil has a 100% retention rate. Every time you go to church on Sunday and your pastor speaks, you should be there ready to take notes and learn something from the Bible. You should have a humble heart that says, Lord, I may have been saved for five months, five years, or 50 years, but today as my preacher is preaching, Teach me something from the word of God that represents an eternal truth. They that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. What God fills you with in the arena of wisdom and knowledge and understanding is in equation to your ability to take what is being said seriously. Let me give you an example. If while I'm preaching tonight, you're scrolling on your cell phone for social media, you not only have a disrespect for the holy word of God, you're probably not even saved. I told you when I started, I'm gonna do my best to offend everybody with equal opportunity. But it's time in the 21st century we had a generation of preachers with backbones like two by fours that are not afraid to open up the Bible and say thus saith the Lord. God give us a return to the sacredness of the Holy Bible and what it represents. I don't say that mainly or picking on you. I'm just trying to give you a practical illustration as to where you're at with God. And if you can sit in a service when the word of God is being preached and you are so dull and so distanced from the content of the golden wisdom of eternity's ages that you'd rather look on Instagram to see what Kim Kardashian wore today, then you're not even saved, period. I'll tell you how we'll have a revival in America if we could just get people to spend as much time in the Bible and prayer as they do on their cell phones, we'd have a move of God. It disturbs me to say this, but this was just recently done. I believe it was by Pew Research. The average American citizen spends 74% of every waking moment with a digital device in front of their eyes. 74% of every waking hour with a digital device in front of their eyes. And it's an easy trap. It's almost mind-numbing, even in ministry. I believe in using social media. I believe it's a wonderful resource for advertising. It's a wonderful research tool for getting information. It's a wonderful way to send out prayer requests. It's a wonderful way to tell people where you're at. It's a wonderful way to communicate vision. But if you're not careful, you can find yourself and all of a sudden five minutes have gone by and you don't remember. Ten minutes have gone by and you don't remember. An hour has gone by and you think, how did that time get through my hands so carelessly? Psalm 103, the Bible says, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. You'll never have a holy heart if you don't have holy eyes. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 22, the Bible says, your eyes are the window to your soul. And the devil figured out in early humanity that the greatest and most easy bridge for sin to find a place of logic is just get people to have an unguarded eye. 
Matthew 6, 22, your eyes are the window to your soul. It goes on to say, if your eyes are healthy, your spirit will be healthy. But if your eyes are undisciplined and sickly, your spirit will be diseased. The psalmist said in Psalm 103, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. If you're going to walk in the favor of God, you're going to have to learn to discipline your eyes. If you're taking notes, number one, the dilemma. We're talking tonight about how to walk in the favor of God in the last days. I want to be honest enough to tell you there's a dilemma. The dilemma is that people throughout the world struggle with, in all human history, there has never been a single person exempt from this dilemma. And the dilemma is found in the beginning of the Bible with Adam when he sinned against God and with his wife Eve, they were banished from the Garden of Eden and from the presence of the Lord. Romans in the New Testament puts it this way. Wherefore, by the sin of one man, Adam, sin entered into the world and so death by sin. So let me state this very clearly because if you're going to understand the supernatural favor and blessing of God, you must understand what will kill it. And what will kill it quickly is unrepented sin. Sin separates us from a holy God. Sin separates us from a holy God. And quit thinking in terms of sin and behavior and start thinking in terms of sin being handcuffs that keep you from the supernatural outpouring of what God wants to do. Because it'll motivate you differently if you realize it's the thief of God's blessing. Romans 5 and 12, the Bible said, when Adam's sin, sin entered the world, Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone for every one sin. The prophet Jeremiah said in the 17th chapter and the 9th verse, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? And don't miss this, from this preacher on down the line, I'm not judging you. This is going to be tough preaching. I told you up front, this is going to be a little offensive for some, but it's going to be meat that will take you from mediocrity to miracles. And some of you have been asking God for years in your walk with the Lord, what is it that I need to do to take me to a level that I know I'm supposed to be at, but I just can't seem to get there? How do I get above the problem? How do I get above health problems? How do I get above relationship problems? How do I get above financial problems? How do I get above mental problems? How do I get above addiction problems? I'm here to tell you that everything God touches goes up. Everything God touches is blessed. Everything that God touches will move forward and the trajectory is always in a good, good way. Amen. Proverbs 20 and verse 9, the Bible says, Who can say I've cleansed my heart and I'm pure and free from sin? That's the Old Testament equivalent to all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God in Romans chapter 3. But even in the old covenant, who can say, I have cleansed my heart? You can't cleanse your own heart. You can't be a better person. You can't go hear a motivational speaker and buy all his products and his books, spend a weekend at a, at a self-help convention, buy a book on your best life now and read it and think you're going to change. First of all, your best life now is not here. Your best life is yet to come. This is not the best life. This is only a test and a trial for the eternity that really is the best life. We got a lot of preachers preaching on self-help. But you can't help yourself. 
How many years are you going to serve the Lord before you figure out you can't discipline yourself to be a better person? Most of you listening to me cannot go on a diet and lose five pounds. What makes you think you're going to overcome sin? I told you I was going to step on some toes tonight. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's stepping. The apostle Paul, though he was used by God to write almost one third of the New Testament, understood this dilemma in a very personal way and wrote about it. Listen to what the apostle Paul said in Romans chapter seven and verse 18. He said, and I know that nothing good lives in me. This is the apostle Paul. God used him to write a third of the New Testament. He confessed in his letter to the Romans, I know that nothing good lives in me. That is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. Everybody within the sound of my voice understands that practical confession of Paul. I want to do right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. This is Paul not talking about his life after conversion. This is Paul talking about when he was religious and without Christ. He goes on to say in chapter 7 and verse 20, but if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing it. It is the sin living in me that does it. I have discovered this principle of life that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart. And many of you could say the same. I love God's law with all my heart. Verse 23. But there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death. Now remember the context. This is Paul talking about what his life was like when he was simply a Pharisee and walking in the realms of the law and religiosity. He had not yet found Christ, but he went on to say in verse 24, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ the Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. Amen. Let me make it as clear as I know how to make it so that even your grandchildren can understand it. As long as you live in a body of flesh, you are going to have a fleshly nature. You are going to have carnal desires. You are going to have unholy appetites. That's a part of the human nature. And you can crucify it in a revival on Sunday night and it'll make a fresh resurrection on Monday morning. As long as you live in a body of flesh, you are going to have to make decisions between a life of righteousness and a life of ruin. And don't ever forget the dilemma. The dilemma is sin. And if you don't get rid of sin, sin is going to get rid of you. If you don't get rid of sin, sin is gonna get rid of you. Years ago, I heard a news story of a man in a church, Pentecostal church, involved in leadership. And there was a revival in his local church. And one night the Holy Spirit spoke to the pastor and said, go tell brother so-and-so if he doesn't get rid of sin, sin's gonna get rid of him. The pastor didn't wanna do it. He was fussing with the Lord in his spirit saying, Lord, he's a part of the leadership of my church. He's a, he's a personal friend. 
But as the pastor was praying for people at the altars on that Sunday night, the Holy Spirit whispered louder inside, Go tell brother so-and-so if he doesn't get rid of sin, sin's going to get rid of him. And so eventually the pastor walked over and said, brother so-and-so, I don't know why the Holy Spirit has asked me to say this, but I know that I know that I know I have to be obedient to the Lord and I don't know what this means, but perhaps you will. But God is saying if you don't get rid of sin, sin's going to get rid of you. The man got so mad at the pastor he spun on his heels and stormed out of church in a tiff. The pastor had no idea other than he was being obedient to the Lord. Several days later, a man was locally going on a business trip. He stopped at the gas station to fill up his automobile with gas in that same town. And the gas station owner told that man who was going on business, he said, I don't want to get into your business, but before you leave town, why don't you wait a little bit and then drive by your house? He said, what? He said, I'm just saying. The man had filled his car up with gas, drove by his house, parked at a distance. And as the sun was setting, he saw an automobile in a back alley that went behind his house, roll up, lights went off, a man in the shadows got out, went up his back steps and went into his house. He happened to carry a revolver and he pulled it out thinking somebody was breaking into his house and perhaps going to harm his wife. He ran to the house, opened the door, heard noise upstairs, ran upstairs, opened the bedroom door. And that man was the man that the pastor had said, if you don't get rid of sin, sin's going to get rid of you. He wasn't robbing the house. He was having an affair with that man's wife. That man in a sheer state of rage shot both of them to death. And exactly as the pastor had said, if you don't get rid of sin, sin will get rid of you. Some of you need to hear the tapping of the Holy Spirit on your heart as it comes in love and warning. Either you get rid of sin or sin is going to get rid of you. And you can hide it and you can keep wearing your mask and you can keep pretending and you can keep putting your best polished shoe forward. But the Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. The Bible says in the gospel of Mark, there is nothing hid that will not be made manifest. And don't miss what I'm about to say. You may not like it, but this is one of the keys to walking in the favor of God. The Lord is rich in mercy and he'll call and he'll speak and he'll give you opportunity. But if you don't get rid of sin, you can be sure that sin will get rid of you. And don't miss it. When you make a decision to hide your sin, then God immediately makes a decision to reveal your sin. Mark said what? There is nothing hid that will not be made manifest. And some of you are teetering. The Holy Spirit has said, quit it. And you're trying to justify why you need it. But the Holy Spirit is speaking to somebody tonight. And if you make that decision to hide it, then I prophesy God's about to make a decision to reveal it. And when I give the invitation to come to this altar and turn from sin and turn to Christ, you would do well to reach out and take the hand of the Father while it is yet merciful. For you will never meet the God of wrath until you disrespect the God of mercy. 
But if you disrespect the God of mercy, you will surely meet the God of wrath, for he is just in all his ways. Number two, the decision. The dilemma is sin. Sin separates you from God. Sin destroys everything that it touches. James 1.15, sin when it is finished brings forth death. You will never walk in the supernatural favor of the Lord with unclean hands and an unclean heart. And I don't care who you're listening to on Christian television that says if you'll sow a thousand dollar seed into their ministry that you'll be a millionaire in six months. You're as stupid as they are. <laughs> Giving money does not wash sin away. You cannot buy your way out of a sinful lifestyle. Amen. Offerings do not wash sin away. Amen. We've all heard them on television say, the Lord spoke to my heart that the first hundred people that would sow a thousand dollars or whatever the figure might be, God said that in the next three months or six months, that's how you know you're listening to the devil's bastard children. Because any preacher, male or female, that says that God will bless you is a liar because they don't know how you're living. And if they tell you that your seed or your offering guarantees a blessing, I can't guarantee you a blessing. You can give this ministry a million dollar check and go to hell tomorrow because I don't know how you're living. But if you're walking in the favor of the Lord, if you're walking in the covenant of the Most High, if your hands are clean and your heart is pure, then your seed will always prosper. But these preachers who use scandalous, dirty fundraising, fundraising techniques to pay their budgets will burn in hell. Bible says all liars, all liars. Getting hot in here or is it just me? <laughs> the dilemma is sin, but there's a decision that each of us can make. Romans chapter six, verse 16, the Bible says, don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. The Bible said you can choose to obey God. When I give the invitation in the moments to come, it literally is an opportunity for you to say to a holy God, I repent of my sin. The word of God, the preaching tonight, open my eyes to see that sin is a curse. I don't want to live under the curse. I want to live under the blessing of God. And you can choose God. By coming and kneeling and praying what many people call a sinner's prayer tonight, you can choose God. The scripture says in Romans chapter 3, verses 22 through 25, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God with undeserved kindness declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin and people are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life shedding his blood. We talked about the dilemma and now I'm putting the focus of God's light upon the decision. People are made right with God. No matter what you've done, 
Now this is hope. The dilemma was a little rough to hear for some of you, but here's the hope. The hope is you can make a decision that will change everything, not just for a day, but for all of the days of your life. Even in the Old Testament, we see God providing a choice between life and death and between prosperity and disaster. That was the covenant spoken by Moses. That was the covenant reiterated by Joshua. I put before you the choice between prosperity and disaster. Prosperity is a choice, just like disaster is a choice. And some of you have never walked in the supernatural favor of God because you have not yet matured enough to take responsibility for your decisions. You're blaming your mother, you're blaming your father, you're blaming your school, you're blaming your neighborhood, you're blaming your boss, you're blaming your husband, you're blaming everybody except yourself. But life is about personal choices. And until you take responsibility and ownership for your decisions, you'll never walk in the supernatural favor of God. You need to learn how to easily, effortlessly get on your knees every day and say, Father, I take responsibility and I bow before you. My time is in your hands. I want to tell you something. As long as you carry a victim attitude, you'll never walk in the supernatural favor of God. Some of you have every legitimate right to play the victim card. You have a legitimate right. There are people within the sound of my voice that have every right to say life didn't treat me fair. You have every right to say I wasn't born into the right home. You have every right to say I was abused. I was beaten. I was cursed at. My parents were drunkards. I was raped. I was sexually abused. I was tormented. I was locked in a basement. I was kept from being able to eat. I was starved. I was kept in a dark closet. You have every right to tell your horror story. But I came to tell you, take all of your life. Bring it down to the cross of Jesus. Let him wash it in the blood and set you free. You can make a choice. And the sad thing is, is we've got a dysfunctional government, an academic system that's making everybody socially dependent on this and dependent on them and dependent on this and dependent on that. God doesn't want you to be dependent on anybody except his holy hand. He is the one that will take good care of you. As long as you're going to be a victim and allow unsaved men to be the dictators of the course of your life and blessing, you're in trouble. Because as quick as they'll give it to you, they'll take it away from you. My blessing is not dependent upon the government. My blessing is dependent upon the Holy Bible. My God is a good God. The shoes on my feet he gave me. The clothes on my back he gave me. Everything I have, everything I ever hoped to be, I owe it all to Jesus. I don't owe it to the government. I don't owe it to anybody. And I'm not being disrespectful. I'm telling you there is a God who is high and holy and his ways are higher than your ways. They'll keep you on victim mentality one drip at a time. But when the favor of God supernaturally gets released in your life, it's like a mighty river. It will come and overtake you like a wave of the ocean. Fill you with joy and peace and happiness and blessing. Even in the old covenant, the children of Israel were told, you can make a choice you can choose prosperity or you can choose disaster. 
Turn to your neighbor and say, I choose prosperity. prosperity. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lastly, and I close with this, the dividends. We've talked about the dilemma, the dilemma to supernatural favor, walking in supernatural favor, is sin. Sin separates us from a holy God and the supernatural favor comes from the hand of a holy God. So we get rid of sin before sin gets rid of us. We come to God and take ownership for our behavior, for our decisions. Almost everything in your life that is not in proper function is because of a decision that was made outside of the will of God. Because in the will of God, every decision will take you higher in his blessing. Many people struggle to believe. Hear me. Because many of you that are listening to me, by the way you were raised, you were raised by parents who were negative. Every time, if you went to a restaurant, you were given orders in the parking lot that whatever the cheapest thing was on the menu, that's what you had to order. But daddy, I don't like monkey brains. It's on sale, you're gonna eat it. Now I'm gonna get close to home. Now some of you are 50, 60, 70 years old, 80 years old, 90 years old. And when you go to a restaurant, you could order anything that you wanted to order. But you're still bound by that unholy negativity that you were raised with. And instead of ordering what you want, your eyes scan down the price list. What you want is $16.95. But there's something that you could live with that's $13.95. And over a stinking $3. You're laughing because I'm stepping on your toes. I'm trying to help you see in a practical way that even when people get saved, even when people choose God, nobody help them to understand that you're a child of the Most High. You are no longer the property of sin. You are a child of the King. You're a son of God. You're a daughter of the Most High and you're worth it. Somebody drive home tonight and get 10 quarter pounders just to make the devil mad. (laughs) For the love of God, don't eat them, but just make the devil mad. (laughs) The text that I read to you, the Bible said, he'll show you the path you should choose. And if you walk in the path that God chooses, He said, you will live in prosperity and your children will inherit the land. I close with this and I've saved the worst to last. I've given you a little honey. Now we're gonna go back to a dull saw. But this is gonna help you. Because here's where I'm going to love you enough to talk to you just like I'd talk to my son or my daughter. Because as we close tonight, I want to give you practical stuff that will help you make life decisions to take you from where you're at to the supernatural favor of God. And I know it's hard for you to believe that God will do it. But I was in a church this year in Texas where a man who was living under a bridge was witnessed to by a Christian in that church, felt led of God, 
driving the church saw the man living under the bridge and turned around. He felt the Holy Spirit speak to his heart. Invite that man to church and buy him breakfast. He was obedient to the Lord. Took that homeless man to church. And that morning when Pastor Lingerfeld gave the invitation, that homeless man was one of those that went forward to receive Christ. The Lord spoke to that same man who was a business owner and said, hire him and give him a job. He hired the man with no skill sets that pertained to his job, but mentored him and helped him. The man, after a while, went out on his own. This is all in less than a year's time. Because the Sunday morning that we started our Lost Lamb Crusade, Pastor Gene invited the man to the platform that had been homeless less than a year ago. He called him out by name. I won't do it because of my media following. I don't want to embarrass him. But he said, what did you drive to church today? He said, I drove to church today in a brand new Mercedes. He said, you did. Yes, sir. He said, how much debt did you have to go into to buy that? He said, Pastor, I paid cash. You did. Yes, I did. As that man shared his testimony from living under a bridge and an entire life of everything that could go wrong went wrong. But he came into the house of God because some Christian loved him enough to share the gospel of Jesus. And God took that man who had nothing, made him a king's kid, showed him the paths of righteousness. And that Sunday morning, he's his own business owner. He employs people. He feeds the homeless where he used to hang out. And God has prospered him. I'm not here, listen carefully, I'm not here guaranteeing you that if you give your heart to Jesus, you're going to drive a Mercedes next week. That's not the point. The point is, with men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God, all things are possible. The point is, many of you love God, but your God in your mind is as poor as your grandmother in the Depression. But God's not poor. He's a big, big, wonderful God who created everything that is. And I'm not worried about temporary things for I've learned that one of the supernatural keys to walking in the favor of God is fix your heart upon God's covenant. Fix your heart upon eternal values. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all other things shall be added unto you. I was in a church not long ago in that particular church like this church. Very gracious church. Very gracious orderly pastor. And just like this church, they assigned a driver to me and a bodyguard. Do I look like I need a bodyguard? But nonetheless, they're being gracious. And that man picked me up all week just like Alex. Same spirit. Humble, Gracious, class. We'll pick you up at 620, pulls up at 619, never a minute late. And all week long, that man treated me so kindly that I almost felt embarrassed because I remember where I came from. I know that some of you think that I'm preaching something I never lived. But when I started out in evangelism, my wife and I were homeless the first four years. We didn't have a home. We didn't have an apartment. We didn't have a trailer. 
We had nothing. The day I got married, we walked down the aisle and got married. I had $4 in change in my pocket and that was all I had. I didn't have a bank account. I didn't have a credit card. And I'll be honest with you, as I'm talking about it, I still remember that feeling in, in the gut of my stomach. Watching my beautiful bride come down the aisle and feeling like I'm failing her. She deserves better than this. But she knew that we were both called into ministry and we both loved the Lord and we were willing to start wherever. The Bible says, despise not the day of small beginnings. Four dollars and change. The reason I didn't have a bank account is back in 1979 to open up a bank account, you had to deposit either 50 or 100 dollars. And I had, didn't have 50 dollars, let alone 100. I remember going to five banks trying to open up a bank account and being rejected five times in one day. Each and every one of them required either a 50 dollar deposit or a $100 deposit, and I didn't have $10. And the day I got married, I only had $4 and I think 30 some cents. No backup plan. No credit cards. Back in those days, you had to have two years of established credit history before you could apply for a credit card. Now they give credit cards out to kids in junior high school. My first year traveling full-time as an evangelist, I made $3,318. I have slept in my vehicle in too many rest areas to count. I know what it's like to go to a meeting and jokingly turn to my wife and pull the last quarter to our name out of my pocket and laugh and say, we made 25 cents profit this week. And as I'm laughing, saying we made 25 cents profit, I came around a turn and there was a 25 cent toll. <laughs> Put my last quarter in the toll and say, well, correction, we broke even. I'm not one bit sorry. I'm not telling a sob story. I had to live what I'm preaching to you. We started with nothing and everything I have has come from his holy hand I close with this don't miss it if I had time I'd preach out of Luke 16 a little bit but if you have time read it before you go to bed the parable of the shrewd manager who handed out the money bags to three different individuals. And one of the things that you'll learn out of Luke 16 is that if you're not faithful in little things, God cannot bless you with bigger things. Many of you made a promise to God years ago when you had nothing, that Lord, if you ever bless me, I'll do this or I'll do that or I'll give you this percentage of everything that comes into my business. And when you were nothing, you made promises to God and by his grace, he's brought you even further, but you forgot what you said you'd do. The Bible says that if you're faithful in little things, he'll make you ruler of great things. So I'm gonna close with a little medicine that'll help you. Raise a hand to heaven and say, Father, I receive this before I go home tonight. Are you ready for some solid gold? The greatest favor of God does not rest upon your ability to make money. The greatest favor of God rests upon your ability to manage money. It's one of the single highest reasons why people never move into the supernatural flow of God's abundant provision. They think everything is about making money. 
But with God, it's about managing money. Everybody that's not lazy can make money. But only those directed by the wisdom of the Holy Ghost or had a parent that paid the price and passed it on understand the golden principles of managing money. Matthew 25 and verse 29, to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. Highlight that in your Bible. In the last days, if you want to walk in the abundant provision of God, you're gonna have to start making life choices on what you do with what God puts in your hand. Because he watches what you do with the little things that he puts in your hand before he can decide whether to promote you to a higher level of supernatural provision. Do you manage your money well? Do you live within your means? I told you I was gonna talk to you just like I talked to my children. Now many of you are old enough to be my parents. So I mean no disrespect and many of the older people have already passed these tests. I hope you have. Do you carry credit card debt? Are you faithful with your tithes and your offerings? Are you a giver or a taker? I don't have to spend a lot of time around people before I can figure out whether they're givers or takers. And takers are never blessed. Now it's a little different here because your pastor and his wife have a different level of understanding of blessing and honor. But everywhere I go, I take care of my own travel. I pay my own plane fare. I pay my own hotel. I pay all my own expenses. Everywhere I go, and I'm not boasting on myself, I'm just wanting you to see something because I had to learn this. Everywhere I go before I leave, I stop by a day or two in the front office and ask Rochelle who manages money. Because I'm asking God everywhere I go, where can I plant seed? What can I do that would honor you? How can I be a blessing to someone else because you've been so good to me? And I leave with an envelope, usually with several checks in it. And when I get somewhere, I sow. I brought an offering for Sunday morning because I'm not a guest that comes here expecting everybody to take care of me. I learned a long time ago, God watches the little things. And because I faithfully plant seeds in his honor and in good soil, I keep myself in a position of continual harvest. If you only sow a seed once a year, don't be surprised if you only see a blessing once a year. But if you'll learn to sow seed, now some of you are gonna have to start where you're at. I've given more away in the last three days than I used to make in an entire year. But I didn't start there. I remember sacrificially giving away a dollar. I remember asking God for faith to give away five. I remember asking God for faith to learn how to give 10. I'm talking about those days when I didn't have anything. But I knew that if you're a giver, you will continually walk in a path of blessing. I don't want to be a taker. I want to be a giver. Do you consistently save money? The Bible teaches saving money too. Read the book of Proverbs and the stories of the ants. Read the book of Ecclesiastes and the investment strategy of no fewer than seven investments. Let me just put it to you in straight English. He who never saves money will never have money. 
If you're going to be a giver, you have to orchestrate and manage your money in such a way that you have money because of your planning and because of your sacrifice so that when the Lord speaks to your heart or gives you an opportunity, you had already prepared for it and there's a well that you can go to and give that seed. And then to walk in the significant favor of God, you're going to have to learn eventually to be significant. I remember being in a, a church that was just getting started. And I knew the pastor. It was a friend. And uh, I went there to help him out. And on that Sunday morning, they didn't even have seats. They had metal chairs. And the pastor announced to his church, and of course, you know, pastors do that. You're the family. But the pastor said, the next thing we're believing the Lord for are padded seats. And we've done some homework and done a quote and the initial order will be $7,000. And when he said it, the Lord spoke to my heart and said, buy their seats. That was back when I barely had that in the account and had payroll and other things with employees that was a big step for me back then. I had never given that amount of money before. But in obedience to the Lord, the next day I made a phone call. And I said, do we have $7,000 in the lost lamb account? Madonna said, yes, we do. I said, make it out to the name of the church. And I said, overnight it. And I was obedient to the Lord. And I'll be honest with you, that stung. That stung. But before the year was over, unexpectedly, the largest donation that ever came in, $70,000, came to Lost Land. I'd never had a donation in the ministry probably above 5000 maybe 10000 back in those days. But do you think it was a coincidence that I sold seven and a few months later, 70 out of nowhere came in? I don't think. And so I begin to learn that you need to have a budget and manage well what you have and always be saving and setting something aside so that you can do something. Now let me give you something significant for your life. This is just a guideline. This is not from the Ten Commandments. Moses didn't scratch this on a tablet. But this will give you an idea. This is where I started. Young people especially write this down. Here is a formula, a basic biblical formula on how to structure your financial life. Learn to live on 75% of your income. Say what? Learn to live on a maximum of 75% of your income. The average American lives on 106% of their income. Well, how in the world can you live on 106% of your income? Credit cards. You spend every check you get, you're dependent on next week's check, and you've got credit card balances, and you're living in excess of 100% of your income. As long as you live in that mentality, you will never walk in the supernatural favor of the Lord. Because you're spending money God didn't bless you with. And because you're spending money God didn't bless you with, you have separated yourself from the supernatural provision of the Almighty's covenant. Didn't I tell you in the beginning before I closed it was going to get real practical? Now again, this is not scratched on the tablets of the Ten Commandments. This is just something that I... In my early life, felt God laid upon my heart. Live on 75% of your income. Tithe without fail 10% of everything God puts in your hand. Never, ever budge on that. For the tithe is holy unto the Lord. Now, I'll tell you what else I do. Now, my wife gets our paycheck. I don't get it. That's probably a dangerous thing. I don't suggest it, but I'm not home enough. And so I pretty much am the CEO of Lost Lamb. I manage the finances of Lost Lamb along with people that are on staff. But I trust my wife to take care of our household expenses. And we get paid on the 15th and the 30th, just like many of you do. But my wife and I 
have a covenant with God. Every 15th and 30th when we get paid, the first check we write is our tithe. We believe in first fruit. First check. Seek ye first. Now, I'm not saying that's law. I'm just telling you what my wife and I do. The next checks we write are the ministries we support. And all of the holy money is cut before I ever pay a secular bill. God first, secular world second. Every week without fail. Invest 10%. Save and invest. Learn to do that. Everything God puts in your hand, save some of it. Because if you don't save money, you will never have money. And then give her so the last 5%. And again, you can tuck that into a barrel and wait for the Lord to speak. But if you'll allow that rough formula to become your lifestyle, you will break the curse of poverty permanently on your family's name. Isn't it time somebody broke the curse of poverty and lack and week to week living? Let me help the 20 year olds. If you're a teenager or around 20 years old, let me tell you how you can be the first millionaire in your family. I know this preacher will make somebody mad, but in the last days, I don't trust the government. I don't trust the economy. I trust the covenant. And I'm preaching what God laid on my heart to prepare the church and to prepare God's people to walk in favor right until the rapture. If you're 20 years old, now I know for some of you this is just, your eyes are gonna roll back in your head and say that's impossible. Well, number one, learn how to say with God all things are possible. But I'm gonna give you a formula on how to be a millionaire. If you save $500 a month, some of you say, how in the world can I do that? Get a second job. Get a third job. Work hard. Be creative. I had a 10-year-old in a meeting not long ago at an altar with tears come up to me and say, the Lord spoke to my heart to help you with your missions crusade and I'm gonna give $1,000. Made my eyes misty. That kid didn't have a job, let alone $1,000. Several months later, his pastor sent his offering. And all summer long, he worked, mowed lawns, did everything and anything he could do. I'll guarantee you that God took notice of that little boy and marked him for something supernatural in the last days. I was in the Arctic Circle and a little native boy came up to me and gave me a bag of musk ox fur. Just about the size of a softball. And he said, use this to help kids in the other villages. I didn't know what it was. It looked like it raided the barber shop swept up a bunch of hair and I prayed for him after the little boy left with tears in his eyes the missionary said that's muskox hair and it's worth $70 an ounce and he went out and wandered through the bush with bears and moose and muskox and things that go bump in the night pulling hair off of the bushes and the willows and the 20 inch cranberry bush and stuff because it's worth $70 in Anchorage. They make expensive scarves and things out of it. I still have it and I'll probably never get rid of it. It's on my desk in my office. $70 to that boy was a lot of hard work. And if you allow this government 
to keep treating you, to keep both hands out and be a taker as if the world owes you a living, you will never walk in the supernatural favor of God. You were not created to be a taker. You were created to be a giver. You were created to be a blessing. You were created to prosper. And that's why I hate it and I hate it with a passion. It's because I know who's behind that mentality of keeping people in poverty and lack and day-to-day -day dependence. It's not God your father. It's the powers of sin and Satan. If God has his way, he'll promote you and bless you all the days of your life. Let me ask you what I believe is life's most important question. Where you spend eternity depends upon your answer to this question, so listen carefully. Can you clearly remember a time in your life when you got down on your knees in prayer, repented of your sins, and invited Jesus Christ to be Lord and Savior of your life? The Bible tells us in John chapter 3 and verse 3, unless you are born again, you can never see the kingdom of God. God's Word says all have sinned, all fall short of God's glorious standard. No matter how good a life we try to live, we still fall miserably short of being a good person. We all fall short of God's desire for us to be holy. In his very first message, Jesus said, unless you repent, you will also perish. That word perish means that we will face the judgment of God for our sins when we die. The word repent means to turn your back on sin and turn your heart towards God. It's like a U-turn. You have been walking in your own direction, led by your own desires and will, but now you are willing to turn to God and follow His will and His desires. Becoming a true Christian is not merely believing some doctrine or going to church on Sunday. Becoming a Christian is a personal and deliberate decision that you alone can make. Jesus said in Revelation chapter 3, Behold, I stand at the door of your life and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. You see, Christ is a gentleman. He will never knock the door down and force his way into your life. He knocks gently and waits for you to say, come in or stay out. What are you going to say today? Why don't you make that decision with me right now in prayer? Prayer is simply talking to God from a sincere heart. Jesus has promised that he will not turn away anyone who comes to him in faith. So let's do that together. Will you pray this prayer with me out loud and without shame? Dear God, today I humble my heart before you in prayer. In childlike faith, I repent of my sins and trust in your mercy and forgiveness. The Bible says that if I confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead, that I would be saved. So today I confess that Jesus is Lord and in my heart I believe that he is risen. Come into my life, Lord Jesus, and give me the strength to live for you. Thank you for your love for me. Now, according to your word, today I am saved. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.